Hi everyone and uh, welcome you to this series of Labs to Clinic. Welcome back to another session. Uh, today we are going to uh, we are back with another case of Labs to Clinics where we are going to discuss a respiratory distress in an HIV positive patient. Hope you have been enjoying all the lectures previously that we have taken and uh, basically what we are trying to do is integrate your knowledge of medicine and your knowledge of microbiology and all the diseases that we keep reading in microbiology how to you know, uh, use them when you're finally seeing the patients and what are the clues that you usually miss, you should not miss, what are the microbiological knowledge points that are going to help you. Basically, all of that we uh, like to um, cover in these series. If you have any doubts, please drop them in the chat box. I try to answer as many as possible. So let's quickly begin and let's start with the today's Labs to Clinic series of respiratory distress in an HIV positive patient. So the take home the takeaway from today's lecture is going to be your approach to respiratory distress systematically. How do you pinpoint that in which part of uh, the respiratory system is the pathology going to be and correlate the CD4 count with infections. Because whenever you read about HIV, whenever you read about AIDS, we keep drilling your brains with CD4 counts and associated infections. It is also a very important INI, PG, need PG, you know, competitive exam question as well. But actually in your patients, how are you not going to miss any of these infections? Because CD4 is going to be your biggest clue to all of this. How are your clinical cues are going to direct or, uh, you know, um, actually decide how you're going to take up the microbiological diagnosis of these patients. Then you have to build an exam oriented diagnostic thinking. So basically diagnostic thinking is an art and reaching to the correct diagnosis is also an art. You cannot keep ordering a plethora of uh, good evening Shivam. You cannot keep ordering tests and tests back to back for any patient and whichever might come positive that is going to be your diagnosis. So there is no hit and trial in medicine because uh, the diagnostic uh, tests also have their limitations. So as to that so you should be able to order the right test at the right time, interpret the results according to your disease and not over diagnose your patients also. So what we had was a 38 year old male patient who was a known HIV positive case. He presents with progressive breathlessness in the past two weeks associated with dry cough, low grade fever and weight loss. So this is that much that the patient is telling us and he has come to our clinic with complaints of breathlessness. There is involvement of the accessory muscles, there is nasal flaring and the patient is unable to complete a sentence. That is how much breathless the patient is. The first and um, the first thing that you do is you examine the patient and of course this tachypnea and the patient is unable to speak full sentences and your SpO2 is 86% on room air. Now, the biggest thing that you have to notice here is most of the times so or many a times, many HIV positive patients, they might walk into your clinics wherein the symptomatology might not be as severe but when you look at the examination and when you look at the SPO2 of the patients it is very very poor. So 86% on room air now your patient is definitely in respiratory distress. So you also notice cyanosis in the patient because of uh, the reduced oxygen tension in different parts of the body. There is oral thrush present that means my patient is uh, you know worsening into the disease is probably gone on to full-blown AIDS however there is no lymphadenopathy after this of course as a good clinician you have to stabilize the patient you have to take the uh, ABG of the patient you have to look for any kind of respiratory acidosis alkalosis or any such condition you have to uh, secure the airway you have to secure the circulation take into account the blood pressure and uh, the uh, you know uh, the heart rate of the patient etc so after restoring the patient's airway breathing and circulation once the patient is stabilized you have to move on to start to diagnose this patient right then we go on to the diagnosis and we see that upon examination itself on auscultation there were bilateral fine crepitations no visas there and no focal consolidation could be palpated when you read the palpation or the auscultation of the patient. So this is pointing me towards not so much of a bacterial etiology, probably some, you know, viral or fungal etiology might be there. Then you have to ask the most important things from your patient. What was the duration and progression of the disease? You know that it's been happening for two weeks and what's the ART status and compliance of the patient? In HIV positive patient, this is the most important thing that you have to ask. Whether they have been taking ART and how compliant they are, how regular they are in taking their ARTs. What is the CD4 count? This is probably the most important thing that you need to ask and when was the last viral load? 
done in the, in your patient so so that you need to find out whether the art has been take, he's been taking regularly whether the cd4 count has been improving whether the viral load has been decreasing right so all of these are very important history pointers that you need to ask in hiv positive patients and then you go on to your opportunistic infections history your patient already has oral thrush already has oral thrush right so it is kind of telling me that the cd4 must be less in this patient so do not miss out upon the examination for oral thrush in all your hiv positive patients because that can be your clinical indicator of a less cd4 count also right so we know that he has been irregularly taking ART. He's defaulted for the past six months and he recently restarted his therapy. So, of course, now I need to start thinking about opportunistic infections in my patient. HIV positive with subacute respiratory distress, think opportunistic infections. Of course, you have to take into account the CD4 count, your diagnosis and your clinicals and your suspicion changes with the level of CD4 counts. If it is more than 500, between, more than, between 200 to 500 and whether it is less than 200. You must have all seen this table and it becomes kind of overwhelming and difficult to remember this table where you know that above 500 there is most infections that the patient is uh, susceptible to, right? So, candidiasis, oral thrush, tuberculosis, bacterial pneumonias, uh, lymphomas, everything the patient is susceptible to. It is this count which becomes supremely important, less than 200, wherein your very important PCP, pneumocystis pneumonia, pneumocystis zero VC pneumonia comes into the picture, which is a AIDS defining illness. If this is happening in a patient, you know that the matters have gone beyond HIV positiveness. The patient has gone into full-blown AIDS. Then, of course, there is also esophageal candidiasis, not just the oral thrush, but the candida is also going to infect the esophagus of the patient. Then your coccidian parasite diarrheas, including, uh, you know, uh, cryptosporidium, uh, isospora bella, etc. Less than 100 is when you start talking about toxoplasma. So, you start talking about all the Cs. So, less than 100 is all the Cs. So, your cerebral toxoplasmosis, cryptococcus, cryptosporidium cytomegalovirus the cmv infection and the mac micro uh, mycobacterium avium complex the mac complex so whenever you uh, are extremely confused just remember all the c's they will come in less than 100 and less than 50 is only cmv and mac right actually less than 50 is what makes uh, the patient very very susceptible to cmv infections and you are going to find the association with the retinitis etc okay so not confusing you much less than 500 susceptible to most bacterial infections and common viral diseases less than 200 is going to be pcp candidiasis isospora less than 100 is going to be all your c's so depending upon what the cd4 count of my patient was my most likely causes here of respiratory illnesses pneumocystis zero vc pneumonia if the cd4 count was less than 200 pulmonary tuberculosis because of course in a country like india the most common infection associated with hiv most common opportunistic infection associated with HIV is tuberculosis. Most common is tuberculosis. Because anyways, overall TB is the most common and also even in less than 500 CD4 count, your patient is going to get susceptible to TB. Bacterial pneumonias of course can happen and CMV pneumonia if the CD4 count is less than 50 or less than 100, right? So, up till now, my uh, the uh, common... Uh, DDs that I have made is it could be PCB, it could be TB and it could be bacterial, right? CMV not so much because uh, uh, the patient CD4 count was 180. 180 was the CD4 count of the patient. So it could be uh, if it is a sub subacute onset, dry cough association, mild fever with bilateral interstitial chest infiltrates in the chest x-ray then it's going to be my pointer for PCP, right? So now the next very important thing that I need to go for in this patient is to get a chest x-ray done because now I need to differentiate between PCP, TB and bacterial. So TB is going to have a chronic, uh, chronic cough may or may not be associated with evening rise of temperatures. It is the cavitations, the tubercular cavitations can be seen in these patients. Amongst the bacterial, you are going to see the lobar type of uh, involvement in the chest x-ray. Even on auscultation, you could have found the uh, dampening of the auscultatory sounds or the palpatory, uh, the, uh, upon, uh, you know, um, percussion, you could have noticed any low bar involvement. So, what did we do? We went on to do the chest x-ray and the very, very important LDH, which is going to be a marker of 
PCP, pneumocystis cirrhosis pneumonia. You will do the pulse oximetry so as to keep into account the respiratory distress of the patient, the ABG in order to rule out any complications. Chest x-ray we did and we found bilateral perihilar infiltrates and the ground glass opacities. The very very famous ground glass opacities, you must have seen this in the radiology lectures and you know that every time you have such an opacity, PCP comes in mind for every HIV positive patient, right? So what will you do? You will take the sputum of the patient and if sputum is not possible, the patient is not able to expectorate, you can ask the patient to have an induced sputum. What is induced sputum? You basically give the patient an inhalation of normal saline and sputum comes out. If the patient is very severe, bedridden, you have to have, uh, you know, secured the airway of the patient, then of course, bal specimen, the bronchoalveolar lavage is what you need to take because bronchoalveolar lavage is actually the best specimen for any infectious respiratory Ill disease because that increases your chances of positive positivity by a lot so even you know for tuberculosis we do this gene expert and you all must be knowing this is a pcr which we do for uh, tb which also tells you about rifampicin resistance and it, the uh, result also comes within two hours and it is the most preferred and now been made compulsory by WHN also and TEP for diagnosis of each and every TB patient. The company who makes the gene expert, uh, they themselves have, you know, validated the gene expert on the bile sample. So they also say that the best results you're going to get are in the bile sample. So wherever possible, they should be asked for. We sent the sputum for gram stain and culture. Nothing. It came out to be negative. AFP smear was also negative. CBNAT, which is gene expert, came out to be negative. Then we sent for the fungal stain, which is GMS. What is GMS? Gomori methanamine silver stain. Right? Then if we are suspecting PCP, we are going to send GMS or either immunofluorescent assay. IFA, the, uh, IFA or DFA. What is the difference? Direct fluorescent antibody. You are basically taking a slide in which you have attached the antibodies against PCP. You are putting the patient sample on it, which is going to have the PCP or its antigen. They are going to combine. You are going to attach a fluorescent molecule on top. It's going to fluoresce and give me the result. What about CMV? See, even though CD4 count is 180 and we are kind of not suspecting, but we can never rule out. So you should look for, you should always do PCR because cytomegalovirus is a virus. And who can tell me what are the inclusions that you see with CMV? The very, very famous owl eye inclusion bodies. Owl eye inclusion bodies, which are both intracytoplasmic as well as intranuclear. So it is both intracytoplasmic plus intranuclear inclusion bodies that you see. And for TB, we are going to do the gene expert in this patient. The gene expert came out to be negative. PCR was also negative and no inclusion bodies were seen. You know what we saw in microbiology? We saw that on IFA, we could see the classical honeycomb appearance. The honeycomb honeycomb appearance on IFA of the small little PCPs and on GMS we saw the very very famous and this in fact is this year's PYQ. This is a P, uh, this is a, a neat as well as FMG PYQ of 2025 wherein they gave you this particular appearance. Can you tell me what this appearance is called as? It's called as the crushed ping pong ball. The crushed ping pong ball. Have you seen the ping pong or the table tennis ball? If you pitch cow it from one end, if you crush it from one end, it becomes, it takes this shape. So the crushed ping pong ball appearance is seen on GMS. Why is it GMS? Because Gomori methamine, methamine silver. Silver gives you the black colors. So you can see the black colored fungus in this staining picture. Another name for it is also called as the inverted hat appearance, the crushed ping pong ball appearance, whatever you might like to say. So these are two important image based questions which might be given to you in exam also. The take home or the take away from this is because mostly when the clinicians they, uh, they uh, you know, uh, become whenever they become suspicious of PCP, the most common question asked from a microbiologist is what should I send? And most of the time, while everyone remembers gram stain and culture for microbiological diagnosis, you have to remember that there are many diseases such as PCP which cannot be cultured on routine media. Why cannot be cultured on routine media? If you are aware, then PCP is sort of the most controversial organism ever because the parasitologists would fight that it is a parasite, it is a protozoan parasite, and the my uh, mycologists would fight that it is actually a fungus. Why? Because this has a life cycle of its own and it exists in a just like a protozoan parasite it exists in a cyst stage as well right so there is the cyst and the trophozoite kind of a stage and it goes and uh, lives inside the macrophages specifically attacks the plasma cells leads to plasma cell exudation that is why pcp not just stands for pneumocystis pneumonia 
not just stands for pneumocystis zero we see it stands for plasma cell pneumonia also plasma cell pneumonia right actually pcp is an old nomenclature because earlier it was called as pneumocystis carinae so if some old books give you the word carinae just know that carinae has is no longer used because this has been shown to be a important pathogen amongst animals humans it is the pneumocystis zero vc so pcp pjp everything is good so nowadays it is also being called pneumocystis zero vc pneumonia which some new authors also like to refer to as pjp pjp okay Correct. Right. So it cannot be cultured on routine media. So you cannot send a normal aerobic culture and gram stain and expect to see a PCP. You have to send either a fluorescent assay or you have to send a GMS stain. Best is actually to get a gene expert in the, uh, to get a PCR also in these patients, which can also be done. So every time you have an HIV positive patient with respiratory distress, the first thing that you have to look at is the CD4 count of this patient, which can become your biggest clue of what to suspect. Then imaging is going to be the next clue wherein if you uh, you know have a tb patient you can see cavitations in a uh, bacterial pneumonia you can see the lobar consolidations whereas for viral as well as pcp you can see the ground glass opacities and then you have to go for targeted tests so you cannot order an entire panel of respiratory illnesses in an hiv positive patient because absolutely anything under the sun is possible to have caused infection in your patient right so pneumocystis is obviously pneumonia what are you going to treat it with cortrimoxazole is the doc and steroids if the patient is hypoxic art optimization is what is very very necessary you have to again uh, optimize and ask the patient to take art nicely and then you have the target is to restore the CD4 count, right? And in every patient of HIV with a CD4 of less than 200, PCP profile access needs to be started because we want to prevent the patient from getting a PCP disease. So PCP profile access would also include cotrimoxazole. So lots of the patients are started prophylactically on cotrimoxazole along with ART once they are diagnosed with HIV and if their CD4 count happens to be less than 200 at the time of diagnosis or they have been previously diagnosed any way any time during the therapy during the treatment during the illness their cd4 happens to fall below 200 you have to start the profile access for pcp because the patient might succumb to it right so cotrimoxazole remember always for pcp cotrimoxazole profile access as well as treatment what mistakes to avoid in such a patient missing the art history if the patient is hiv positive it is very important to elicit whether the patient has been compliant with art therapy or not and treating as a bacterial pneumonia first thing that most of us want to do is we just want to give antibiotics and move on with our lives clinical clues are very very important because here it was a it was not a very chronic cuff it was a slowly progressive subacute kind of a cuff with respiratory distress and there was no you know typical association with a productive cuff or night sweats or evening rise of temperature or any such thing plus your CD4 counts. They are going to be your biggest markers for diagnosis, right? So if you have any doubts, of course, you know where to reach me. If you have any doubts still now, you can always refer in the chat box. It was a short and sweet crisp, crisp session, but like I always tell you, simply stay in the game. Just be connected with all the topics that you that, that are there. And even if small little case studies like this, even if they keep coming your way, you keep revising all the important exam based topics. So today you have learned how a PCP patient is going to appear. You have learned two important image based questions for diagnosis of PCP, which is really going to help you solve your MCQs. And uh, you also revise the profile access as well as the drug of choice for PCP, right? So thank you so much guys for joining in if you have any queries i'm available you may ask me otherwise you can always reach out to me on my social media